Good afternoon, and welcome to the Appellate Division First Department. Most of you know the drill. I will call the calendar and ask you for your requested argument time. Please know that currently we have about five and a half hours of requested argument time. No one wants to be here that long. So please ask for the time you actually need to make your arguments. Understanding that the court is fully familiar with your case, the briefs, the record. Sometimes, oftentimes, more than you wish we were. So, and please know that I will allot time based on my perception of what it requires based on the issues before the court. But don't fret, because if you're brilliant in your argument and my colleagues have more questions, we will go beyond the light. I will not stop them as the clock is for you, not for them. That being said, People versus Victor Castillo. Submit. Mata versus 371 First Street. Okay. Five and two and five. B. Daniel versus Deshauna S. is submitted. 310 East 74 LLC versus Maria. Okay. Five and five. People versus Emmanuel. Submitted. 58 East 83rd <laughs> Realty versus DHCR. Five and one and five. WO versus NYU is submitted. Elk. 33 East 33rd versus <coughs> Stickies. Okay. Six and two and five. Diarada <coughs> versus New York City Department of Health. Okay. Three and three. Diarada versus New York Post. Okay. Well, you you only get rebuttal time, and the Post has not requested argument time, so I'll grant you your three. I've consulted with my colleagues. We have no questions of your side. Okay. People versus Shaheen Delaney. Submitted. At last, Sportswear versus Byron. Okay. No respondent? You've scared them away. So you don't get re uh, 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 a rebuttal time since you have no one you're arguing against. Would you like to adjust? your argument time. Okay, let's do five, and if they have more questions, we'll keep going, okay? All right. Certain underwriters versus Martin. Okay. All right, six and one and five. Chlorella versus Trustees of Columbia. Okay. 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 I'm sorry. Three. Okay. Did I get everybody? All right. So give it to me again. Six and two over here. Five and two for the plaintiff. Okay. Third party. Okay, we got everybody. I skipped over, and my apologies, Dragons 516 versus Knights Genesis. My apologies. Okay. All right, let's do six and two and five. Uh, and then we have Zhao versus City of New York, which is a submit. First case on the calendar is Mata versus 371 First Street. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Alan Russo, Russo and Gould for the defendant. Could you please raise the mic so we can hear you? Alan Russo from Russo and Gould for 371 First, the appellant. Uh, as you know from the briefs that have been submitted, we're seeking a reversal of the summary judgment 
issued by the trial court, as well as a dismissal of the 240 claim against uh, the defendants. In addition to that, we're also seeking a dismissal of the 241.6 claims, as well as a dismissal of the 200 claims. And let me just try to be brief and get to the, the salient facts that really govern this case. In order for 240 to apply, there has to be a height differential risk posed to someone working. Well, as I understand it, this gentleman fell through, through, to, through two floors, so I think we've got that covered. Well, it's only covered, Judge, to trigger 240 and the requirement to provide fall protection if the owner is aware or should have been aware, or a general contractor was aware or should have been aware, that there was a, a danger of the floor, a permanent floor that the plaintiff is working on would collapse. Well, that's the first issue, isn't it? Yes. Whether the floor as it was at the point of the accident could be considered a permanent structure, seeing as all of the wood planking that had covered what was the permanent floor had been removed. Well, that's and not And it correct. was at the point that he removed the last piece of wood planking that he falls through the floor. Well, that is not correct, Judge. It was a permanent floor. He was in the process of removing the floorboards that were covering the permanent So the permanent floor, floor is um, plywood over joist? Yes. That's, that is what is considered permanent flooring? Yes, it is a subfloor, but he wasn't, standing, he wasn't standing on plywood. He was standing on the actual floorboard. A subfloor is plywood. And according to the record, he had just... He was in the process of removing the last piece of plywood flooring from the subfloor when the floor gave out. So it says to me that what he was standing on was basically plywood on top of joists. That, uh, that is not accurate, Judge. If you review the record, I did. He was removing. He was removing the floorboards from the subfloor. Right. That's and what that's, I just said. And the subfloor is made out of plywood. Correct. But he wasn't standing on the board. He was removing. He was standing on a permanent floor. It's, think. Think about if you're having your floor replaced in your co-op or condominium. The team comes in. They take off the sur you know, the boards that, that they, you want replaced, there's a subfloor beneath that we know. that supports the floor. Council, so we have about mm, 20,000 labor law cases in this department every year. So we're quite familiar okay. with what subfloors are and what gets put on top of subfloors. I'm just and, and so a subfloor, and please tell me if there is a case that says that a subfloor constitutes a permanent structure. Yes. Where? What case? I don't know what case in specifically, but it is a, it's not, it's <laughs> Well, I looked and I found none, so, it which is, is why I'm asking you. First of all, you're, you're, you're misconstruing the facts. Am I? He was not standing on a plywood floor when this happened. He was lifting floorboards in front of him. While he's lifting the floorboards, he's on the remainder of a regular floor that had the floorboards on top of it. And it was during that process that he claims the floor from under him started to crack, buckle, and then he fell through. So the floor he and, was And he on, fell through so that, so that it's clear. He didn't fall through to the next floor because there was a hole underneath and he fell down another floor. No, he, Isn't that right? That is correct, but he didn't fall through the hole where the chimney was removed. That's a red herring in this case. The original citations by- So you're saying that the, the subfloor on floor number two was also so damaged that no. he fell through that too? He testified, his testimony, his deposition was, he was near where the opening was where they removed the chimney. The mechanics of how he ended up at going to the bottom through the other holes where they removed the chimney is not completely clear, but if you're working right next to an area and there's a calamity, the floor opens up, and who knows how he actually fell? He may have fell to his left, right, and then he ended up at the bottom because there were openings in the chimneys along that area. I'm just right. curious. That's not where he fell. Yeah, I just want to ask you, did your yeah. clients get an engineering report? Did the city require them to have an engineering report before they did this demolition? 
Uh, no, because they were not demolishing the floor. They were not demolishing the floor. They were picking up floorboards and putting new floorboards on top of it. So I, I thought, a, a I thought that, excuse me, I thought that the buildings department issued a violation precisely for that reason, that they did not, as required, have an inspection report of the condition of the floor prior to beginning their work. First of all, there's nothing in the record. Is there a Department of Buildings violation after this accident concerning what I just said? Not that I'm aware of, Judge. Okay. You'll have time on rebuttal. Good afternoon, Your Honor. It's Brian Isaac. I represent the- Counsel, am I correct that there was a Department of Buildings violation following this fall for precisely what I said? You know you are. 503, 504, the record. 504 is what you said, and it says uh, there's a citation for uh, respondents failure to file a special inspection statement of responsibility with respect to structural matters. It's on 504. The entire violation is 503 to 505. Your Honors, it's actually kind of fortuitous that I'm here on this case because my adversary's lead case is, you know, Jones against 1404 Equities. You probably also know, although you're too nice to say anything, that I'm the lawyer who lost Jones. So I'm fairly well familiar with it. I just want to tell you why Jones actually supports my position and why this argument that my adversary says was properly rejected by the trial court. In Jones, I took the position, he cited my brief, I know you probably read my brief. My position was that even if you're walking on a floor that has nothing to do with the work, in Jones they were not doing the work, the guy was just pulling something and he went through. And what I was concerned about was the fact that if you had to have a foreseeability requirement, then you would take the absolute liability provisions of 240 sub 1 of the labor law and actually dilute them so that it could potentially affect ladders or scaffolds or roofs, right? I was wrong. You were right. Judge McGuire wrote a long decision. But here's what he said, and I just want to read it to you because it's so important. I'm quoting. And he demolished my case very effectively. Here's what he said. Our conclusion that liability under section 240 sub 1 under these circumstances requires a showing that the collapse of the floor was foreseeable does not effectively consign plaintiff to the remedies he would have in any event under general principles of negligence. The issue of foreseeability in this context is relevant only with respect to whether the plaintiff was exposed to an elevation-related risk, and here's the key part, and this is what destroyed my argument, and only where the elevation-related risk was not apparent from the nature of the work such that the defendant would not normally be expected to provide the worker with a safety device to prevent the worker from falling. They're demolishing the floor that he's working on. And the fact is, there's a hole right next to him. He's warned not to go to the hole, even though it's not barricaded. And Judge Manzanet, when he fell, this floor is so bad that when he hit the second floor, that demolished too, because they're pulling up the nails that are right there. And there are holes showing that this isn't clear. So look, I understand that I was probably wrong with respect to my concern. But if you're using an area that you're demolishing, for a work surface, it not only brings into play 240 sub 1 of the labor law, it brings in as a matter of law, it has to be that way because it's the functional equivalent of a scaffold. And the Bahari cases and the McGarry cases come in. So I don't see any way that this case has any bearing. And I'll sit down because I think you have the idea. I would just ask you to look at the decision I actually won afterward. It's Mihelis, M-I-H-E-L-I-S against I, it's a weird spelling, small I period park, Lake Success LLC, it's 56 AD 3D 355, where this court said, with respect to Jones, this court's recent decision in Jones against 414 equities is inapplicable to this matter. This case involved the collapse of an interior, that case involved the collapse of an interior permanent floor, which was not part of the demolition and renovation work being performed, and there was no evidence showing that the condition of the floor placed the workers at an elevated related risk. Here, in contrast, the assigned task, by its very nature, which is what happened here, created an elevation related risk in that it involved replacing substandard precast concrete panels on the roof of a building. 
So it's sort of an exception to what we would usually think about for a permanent structure. It creates like a little exception to it, basically. hundred percent. He's doing the work here. Jones, the dispositive fact, as I understand it, and I think I'm right about it, they just weren't doing any work in the area. He was pulling along a, a, a device, and the defense argued successfully that it's not reasonable to expect an owner or a contractor to have to protect against that because it's not the object of the work. Here he fell when the object of the work failed, and he fell. I mean, the they were pulling the, as Judge Manzanet said, they were pulling the floor apart. They were, he was using uh, something to pull out the nails. He was using nails. a metal bar to pull the nails off. And the argument is you want to divorce the top flooring from the subcast. It's just the floor. So I don't think that that makes sense in the context of this court's jurisprudence. Thanks Thank for listening. You. The case is cited by, by uh, plaintiff's counsel. What was being replaced, the panels that the, that the gentlemen who were injured were standing on, was one of the things that were to be replaced. The floor itself in this, in this building during this renovation was not being demolished. They were just changing the floorboards. As I said, if you have a renovation, you call the flooring company in, and there's a permanent subfloor that's supported by joists. And the floorboard he's actually working on is also supported by the plywood, the permanent plywood that is supported by George. Counsel, you keep on ignoring the facts of this case. I'm not At the time of his accident, he says, I was pulling up the last floorboard. So he is standing on nothing but the subfloor. Because he says, I'm not taking this from anyone else but the plaintiff. He says he is pulling up the last of the planks. So what he is standing on is the subfloor. That's the only thing he could be standing on. And if he's standing on a subfloor that is supported by joists. Of course. And it is secured. Even well, we if he's don't know that. standing on that. Well, we do know it. I floor. don't know that because at the time of the accident, he is pulling nails out of the floorboards. So I don't know whether the subfloor was also nailed to the joist. I don't know. Well, there's been no evidence offered that they weren't. And in order to trigger 240 liability, you have to produce evidence, not surmise. Okay. There's no evidence in this case to support any of that. There's nothing to support. <coughs> in fact, the only positive evidence was submitted by the defendants in their motion. We had photographs. We had expert testimony. We had witnesses who said they were unaware of any problems or instability in the floor. The inspection that plaintiff is talking about related to the violations having to do with the failure to barricade that hole. And quite frankly, everyone assumed that that's where he fell through. It was really not until plaintiff's deposition that we found out that he never fell through the hole, that he fell through the actual floor that failed underneath him. Thank you. A shocking accident. Thank you. It doesn't trigger 240. 310 East 74 LLC. I gave them. Who's the other respondent? New York State Division of Housing. So who who responded here? The appellant, and I'm not sure which was, I'm not sure which one responded. All right. When we get there, I'll deal with it. Okay. Okay. You may proceed. My apologies. No problem, Gianna. Uh, 310 East 74 LLC versus Maria, <coughs> defendant appellants. We seek reversal of the lower court dismissal of our rent overcharge claim. Uh, just a brief uh, summary of the facts. The plaintiff sought uh, 
rent from defendants. We're familiar with the facts. Okay. Get, get to your I'll argument. Move on to the argument then. The, the, the stipulation, it seems to me that, that there is a discrepancy between your client's reading of the stipulation right. and your adversary's reading of the stipulation and the court's reading of the stipulation, right? So tell me why the language of the stipulation, what, let me put it this way, what language in the stipulation says that the base preferential base rent of 1750 is the base rent forever and ever until this tenant leaves the building, which seems to be what you're arguing. I would say that the lease writer in 2001, uh, the language in the lease writer in 2001 said that any increases shall be based on the preferential rent. And I believe that- yeah, Keep reading though, because that's not all it says. So you, you, you focus on just that part of the language but there's more language in that stipulation that I think uh, I don't have the dictates. Language in oh, how convenient! <laughs> 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 okay, so it says. Uh, hold on. Oh, where is the language? Does somebody have the line? Oh, here we go. The writer provided, should the tenant choose to renew the terms of this lease, the preferential rate of 1750 shall be used to calculate such renewal rent. Thereafter, that's the important part, each successive renewal rent shall be calculated upon the most recent established renewal rent for us as long as the tenant remains in occupancy. So the way I read that is, the first lease after the stipulation is reached, 1750 is the rent. After that, the rent then, like with everyone else in the city, goes up with each re renewal. This does not say that it stays at 1750. It, it will stay at 1750, but it shall increase as everyone else does in, in line with rent guideline board recommendations, right? And so if they increase it further than that to catch up with rent guideline board, then they're... So you're saying, let's say in year one, mm -hmm. they start at 1750. Correct. Okay. Year two, there's a 2% increase. So now year two, it's 1750 plus 2%, 2 percent. right? Yes. Year three, it's whatever that 1750 plus 2% 2 is, Plus the renewal 2%. That's not what happened. They continued that path for seven years, and then in year eight, in 2008, they have a, a, a substantial jump. Okay. Go ahead. And so, and so you're saying the jump from seven to eight violated? That's what we're saying. Their jump in 2008 violates the agreement and goes in excess of rent guidelines board increase. So it goes above the 2%? I believe so. That was our reading up. Okay, go ahead. Okay. And so to continue. Uh, okay. So our argument is again that they're they're trying to circumvent rent stabilized law by stating that the the increase because it's let me see if I can frame petitioner's argument. Um, because it's in line with the same percentage as Brent Guidelines Board um, increases, that they're in fact not in violation of um, of the rent stabilization, the rent stabilization law. law, which we're saying that their increase is above what what rent stabilized law provides. I'm trying to understand. Are you saying that because ultimately the rent exceeded two thousand dollars, they were in violation? We're saying that they, they accelerated the increases. So in 2001 through 2007, they continued to increase the 2%, 3%, and then they began to increase more without any kind of indication. But at the, what I'm asking you is at the point that, you say, that you're saying that the increases exceeded rents, rents, RSL guidelines, was the rent under 2000 still? Yes, I believe so. Okay. All right. We'll hear from the other side. 
Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honors. For the plaintiff respondent, Rose and Rose by Paul Coffey. <clears throat> um, it is established in the rent stabilization law and the rent stabilization code um, and case law, including the Court of Appeals Casey case, Casey versus White House Estates, that where the rent charged on the base date is known, that rent forms the basis for all future calculations, absent the showing that the base date rent is tainted by fraud. Um, the allegation of fraud in this case is in an answer which is only verified by counsel and really consists entirely of the invocation of the word fraud. Um, even, even aside from recent statutory changes, um, which were enacted subsequent to respondent's brief. Um, the pleading standard for fraud in CPLR 3016B uh, remains. The circumstances said to constitute a fraud uh, must be pleaded with specificity. I well, and look, th this, to me, this is not a very complicated fact pattern. We have a stipulation and we do our assessment based from henceforth, <laughs> right? So the issue is whether at the point, his argument is that after 2008, the increases exceeded what was permissible. What do you say with respect to that particular argument? What I say with respect to that particular argument is that what happened in 2008 is in the distant past and it's examined. Counsel? Only okay, you're going to answer my question, okay? Because this isn't just a exercise in futility for me, okay? So I'm going to try it again. The preferential rent was revoked in 2008. On the basis of what? What entitled your organization to revoke something you stipulated to in court as the base preferential rate? So what? either the increases had reached a level that took him outside of the RSL, which is an argument I'm waiting to hear from you, or you have some other theory that would have entitled your company to just not follow the stipulation. The increases did not take the apartment out of the- I'm sorry? The increases did not take the apartment out of the RSL. There was no attempt at any time to deregulate the apartment. As far as what transpired between the parties in 2008, the record is entirely unclear, and no allegation that it was done improperly exists anywhere in the record. It, there's just no, the fraud claim, there has to be, there has to be not just a colorable allegation of fraud, but ultimately there has to be proof of fraud in order yes. to justify examining you. rental yes. rates from 2008. That's the law, and there just aren't. There, there aren't even colorable allegations, let alone fraud established. And in fact, the appellant, in his appellate brief, entirely abandoned his fraud argument, claiming only that basically any lease, any lease that has anything in it that may run afoul of rent stabilization is void ab initio. Citing Drucker versus Morrow, which is a case in which the landlord and the tenant mutually attempted to entirely contract out of rent stabilization. That's void ab initio. To say that any lease that has an illegal rent is void ab initio is an exception that entirely swallows the rule, and the rule remains. It, it's, it's just the law. There's no fraud pled in any meaningful way in this case. There's not even an affidavit in opposition to summary judgment from either of the tenants. It's just an attorney's affirmation I, with no indication that the attorney has any personal knowledge, and I don't think she did since it happened 
15 years before the briefing of the case. Right. Um, that's the case to me. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. You didn't ask for any rebuttal time. All right. Okay. People versus Emmanuel. No, that one's 58 East 83rd Realty. I understand there's an additional party that did not request time. Is this the case? Yes, Your Honor. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. So, so you need time, you're saying? Yes, I do. Okay. He didn't request time. I did. I was here, but before it moved on before I got to say anything. Okay. So how much time would you like? Um, I would like one minute. Okay. Five and one, four and five. Okay, you may proceed. Sir. Good afternoon, Your Honors. The decision should be reversed uh, because it constitutes an error of law. It lacks sound reason. It contravenes established judicial precedent, and it was made in disregard of the facts. My client sought to establish his intention to demolish the building and establish his financial ability to perform that. Well, was it, wasn't the problem here... Um, the, you were not going to, your client was not getting a loan to fund this, this project. He was doing it, it was self-funding it, right? Right. And so you, you couldn't really get a, a letter like, here, this is the loan and it's being used for the project because there was no loan. So you had to have money um, set aside for this project that could be confirmed. Now, the bank couldn't say, oh, yes, well, this account's going to be used for that. A bank couldn't do that. I, I, wasn't DHCR concerned that you didn't really have liquid uh, money in liquid uh, accounts where you could get at it, where you could say this is being segregated solely for this particular project? Wasn't that their concern? I don't think that, that, were, that was their concern, but I will address that. The courts, I will address the court's concern. There was liquid funds. There was uh, securities in an amount of four times the amount necessary. Except securities are not liquid. Of course. You, and they also, you know, <laughs> go up and... Are, are, are you, 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 ha you have to seek to have them cashed out in order to utilize those monies, right? Well, We're talking right. stocks. Yes, that's a ministerial... That, that's a ministerial... It also takes time, right? So even if it's a day, two days... Right, the and, and there has been uh, cases that have clearly laid out what was required, and they they clearly identified what had to be satisfied, and it and, wasn't and, here. And with respect, not with respect, that was satisfied. The fact that these were marketable securities versus the, uh, deposits in a in a bank. Is a distinction without a difference. What about? And, and by the, the way, the, 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 there was no nothing. Unlike a bank account, cash in a bank, yeah. securities go down in value every day, right? Up and down. Your Honor, there were. <laughs> so the amount of I understand. Look, I understand. I really get it. Yeah. You have four million dollars worth of stocks. The renovation is a million. You should be good, right? Right. Except that you can't segregate those security. The the Fidelity account investment account holders would not give the required letter because Neither there was can no. A bank. Uh, there, there is no way, if I put $4 million into a bank account, there is no way a bank can issue a letter that says Martin Eisenberg will use this $4 million. But they can say Michael Weisenberg has put this amount of money in account, uh, has segregated this number into an account uh, for this specific That's purpose. That's correct. And I, but I, I, I could... The label, whether the account, first of all, this account was segregated. We have sworn affidavits that say the money was going to be used for the performance of the demolition. That is far more dispositive, far more binding than a letter from a bank that says Martin Eisenberg deposited funds in the account. What does that mean? If I, if I, put, if I label that account my trip to Pluto, funds for my trip, funds for my trip to Pluto, I could use those funds for whatever I want. It's the affidavits. Well, counsel, I want to pose another question. Sure. This uh, Fidelity brokerage account, yes. right? Um, 
the holder of that account was not the owner, correct? That's correct. All right. And so the owner was, I believe it was what, D2A2? and The owner was 58 East. 83rd Realty. Okay. The and sole member, member of the of owner that was D2A2. Okay. And, and we submitted, and by the way, this is done all the time. I mean, even the DHCR in the various tenants case said that these, these properties, you know, are, are not held and, and accounts are in different names. But in right. any event, the operating report of, of 58 East Realty was managed by Diana Millich. Mm -hmm. The D2A2, which is the sole member, of the owner. submitted, right, an agreement the, the operating agreement that, that said the sole member, who was also Diana Millich, mm -hmm. has the absolute authority to commit any funds for investment purposes, absolute discretion. So what was submitted here? Diana Millich on behalf of 58 East 83rd as the manager, and on behalf of D2A2 as the general manager of the sole member, submitted an affidavit that said, we swear under oath, I swear under oath, mm -hmm. that the funds in this account will be committed and allocated solely for the performance of the demolition. I don't know that anything, I don't know that a, that a, that a owner self-funding could do anything more to satisfy the statute. I mean, it, with respect to the court, if the court denies the application here, it will be impossible for any self-funding owner to demolish this building which he has a right to do. We complied with every statutory judicial precedent requirement. And, and the fact that these funds were in marketable securities, otherwise you're asking somebody to keep money in a bank for five years. With Counsel, I just want to go back if I can, sure. because you know th there are a lot of discrepancies. So we already know that the owner is not the holder of the Fidelity account. So you say millage. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. You are. And you're talking about the affidavit. So is that the third affidavit that you're referring to? I'm referring to four affidavits. OK, because let me go to the third. Because you know there are a lot of discrepancies. And the reason why I bring this up is because in the third affidavit, millage says that it's D2A2 and not the owner that allocated funds in the Fidelity account for the demolition project. So like, we're all over the place. Is it the owner? Is it D2A2? Who is it? With, with great respect, it's crystal clear. It is not all over the place. This is a, con this is a, con a, a con contrived. Mm. It's very clear. And if you look at the Peckham case, same thing. An affiliate submitted uh, uh, and with the court granted uh, the application. The various tenants case. There is no discrepancy at all in the documentation. It is crystal clear as to who Diana Millich is, that she's the manager of the owner, and D2A2 is the sole, is the sole member, and Diana Millich has the absolute authority to commit the funds. I mean, is there any reason why they can't set up a cash account in another financial institution? They could, but I don't understand what, what, the, what the difference would be setting up a cash account and then a bank can't. We tried to get a letter from Fidelity. In fact, you can't get a letter from a bank either in the Peckham case, which is cited. Okay, you've said this now three times. Okay. You'll have time on rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Aida Reyes. I'm representing the Division of Housing and Community Renewal. Um, in this matter, and why why isn't uh, uh, council's argument valid that this is a uh, distinction without a difference? The 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 project only requires a million dollars. They have shown evidence of four million dollars in a fidelity account. Why isn't that enough? Um, Your Honor, I would actually. Um, look to the record to show, especially regarding the, the discrepancies that the uh, other justice had mentioned. Um, at first, the, the very first thing that was submitted to the rent administrator um, was simply the operating agreement of 58 East 83rd LLC, the owner, and um, and D two A two, sort of the operating agreement. But there was nothing, that, no affidavit from Diana Millich explaining explaining 
how the funds were to be used, what they were for, is it an operating account, is it, there's no label on the account, there's, no, there's nothing. And the tenants immediately pointed that out and the RA asked for clarification and, to, and for the owner to, <coughs> um, to clarify, okay, so do you, like, what's the point? And so then, so if I would say I'd written it out, let's see, um, the first, um, the, it was filed in, 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 in June of 2019. The first affidavit pointing out that the a Fidelity account had $1.7 million um, and that they were adding money to it was months after that, on, on August. Then the tenants had even more, one, more clarification regarding that. Um, and by the way, the costs also st varied throughout the record. If you look closely at the DOB filing, the architect has a different cost. Then they, the architect, they file another architect's affidavit throughout. So the numbers are changing throughout. Cost, none of the cost differentials would absorb the $4 million on it. Well, hand. the $4 million didn't come till, uh, till 3 2020. So, okay. so then they added to the account. And if you look closely at the but records. If, if you know that, you, you aren't taking all of these things into consideration. I, I mean, maybe they should have given you everything at the beginning. Uh, that might have been better, you know, hindsight. But now that you have all that information, what else is it that you need to sub substantiate their claim? Um, just a letter from the financial financial institution saying that this is a segregated account and that it's for that purpose. Well, how, can, how, can a yeah. how can a financial institution tell you what the, what the purpose of an account that they're holding? I mean, it's his account. He could do whatever he wants with it. He doesn't have to tell the bank, by the Agreed. way. There's not going to be perfection, but one of the reasons why they want to be 100% sure that this isn't going to be just an account that they're on the side that they use to fund um, is, is to get a, a third party uh, confirming that they have they have the funds in there and they have labeled them for a certain reason. How is it um, that there's not some mechanism or procedure for a self-funding owner in this situation? We're adding uh, potentially unnecessary costs to this project if they have the money and the money is available. This this letter that the that, that they're that is contemplated by the the bulletin is not the letter that can be given in this situation and may offer no material comfort for, 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 the, for the point you're seeking. Um, but I would suggest that this is, I mean, the, the, the owner was represented by counsel. Um, it is, there is a clear path. I mean, there is a way to segregate these funds so that there is an actual bank account with cash in it. Well, what, com go ahead, go ahead. what comfort does that give you that does not prevent the owner from moving the money or using the money in some other way, unless you had an affidavit or an agreement with the owner. I think that may be what would give you that I comfort, see. not the letter from the financial institution. Uh, agreed, but like the, at, the same, at the same juncture, along with, you have to look at the record in context, along with the um, change, the change, the discrepancies regarding um, how they were to pay. And, and the architect seemed to think that at some point that they were going to get a loan, which would have not committed their funds, excuse me, would not have committed their funds to, um, to, to deplete. That's not how I read the architect's uh, submission. Uh, the way I read what they said was that typically what they see is that a loan is taken for this type of work, not that the plaintiff here said anything about that they were gonna get a loan. Um, so I, I don't think that that's what the architect said. Well, no, but uh, but it's just it's just another inconsistency. Were were they to get a loan? How is that inconsistent? The architect says typically owners get a loan to do construction. How is that inconsistent that this particular uh, owner doesn't need one? Your Honor, um, can I just answer? Yeah. Um, Yes, well, in, in this instance, it would be best practice, right? Best evidence, right? So what we're looking at here- What's best evidence? Um, for best evidence, if you have a letter of commitment, right, from the bank saying that they would- But, that, but that you know, I, I gotta tell you, the him. more I'm listening to this argument, it makes no sense. Give me an affidavit from a bank 
who can't hold the account holder to anything they said, right? Because an instance, a bank, the securities holders can't say, oh no, Mr. So-and-so, you said you were holding this money for X purpose. We're not gonna let you take it out. That wouldn't happen. So what is the point of asking for a letter that, as my colleague pointed out, means nothing in the scheme of things? Why is that not arbitrary and capricious? It's not arbitrary and capricious because- Why not? Precedent. It means nothing. You're asking for a letter that is issued on Monday and on Tuesday, he can take every penny out of that account and you can't do anything about it. So what is the point? I don't mean personally, obviously. I understand that, I understand that. I mean, the point is that the, the, there is no 100% protection, but DHCR is entrusted um, meant by Mitch Case Law, Sohn versus Calderon, um, to make these kinds of decisions based on the previous, um, based, on, based on their expertise as to what they consider good evidence. And I would say that DHCR had the ability to weigh the evidence with all the other kinds of cases that come before it where these kinds of things are gotten and the, and the uh, discrepancy among the D2 a2, and whether or not they're obligated. I mean, there's basically a legal instrument that says that they're not obligated to pay. So we don't know if they're going to use that or not. There's no surety in anything. Okay. But at the very least, DHCR can weigh the evidence, look at the entirety of the record, and decide whether that was enough, because that's in the, that's in the regulations. The regulations say what we deem appropriate at the time. And I do not think it's arbitrary and capricious with this particular record to ask for something from a third party just corroborating that, that this is so, especially when, if you look at the record, um, it goes up and down. You, you can see that there's up and down. Yes, there's enough money in the account, and yes, there can't be 100% certainty with the letters um, provided like in Peckham or any of the uh, cases, right. but we do the best with the can because the, 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 it's, it's very great to, um, what do you, excuse me. Um, it's a very high burden because you have tenants that have been living here for 30 years and you, you want to make sure, right, that this is a, a decision, right, that, that, that they can, that they don't, um, that they have good faith, okay. right? That's Thank all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You have time. Good afternoon, Your Honors. I'm Edward Filmeyer. I'm representing Connie Leslie in this case. Uh, she has lived in this apartment for more than 40 years and is uh, supporting the court below, asking that this court affirm it and saying that the DHCR made the appropriate decision in this case. Let me talk about some of the uh, misconceptions, I think, that have been bandied about here. First of all, the owner is not self-funding this. The owner has not shown, the owner, 58E83 Realty LLC, has not shown it has any money at all in the record. Is that the, dis the discrepancy, sir? That the, no. The well, that's between part the of owner it. and the other entity? Yeah, that's part of it. D2A2 is the entity that allegedly has all these funds available. However, but if D2A2 is the sole member of the owner, what's the problem there? In the operating agreement of the owner, 58E83 Realty, it specifically says that D2A2 is obligated to make a $100 initial contribution, capital contribution, and it is not obligated to make any other capital contributions, whatever. So in the operating agreement of 58E83, there's nothing that obligates D2A2 to put additional funding into the project. Some of the discrepancies have to do with the representations made by Dan and Millich. There's, in the operating agreement, it says D2A2 is the sole member. However, if you look at the application submitted to the DOB, Department of Buildings, Diana Millich represents herself in an affidavit as a member of 58E83 Realty. All right, that's a discrepancy. She doesn't do it just once. She's made that, she made that representation three or four times in different places, and I, in my brief, I identified in the record specific places where she's done that. That was one of the discrepancies. <coughs> the other discrepancy that I believe the court has, uh, is disregarding to some extent is what the, what the architect said. 
Now, if, <clears throat> if I were representing the owner and submitting an affidavit from an architect to support the position that D2A2 has all these funds and they're going to put it into the project, I wouldn't have that architect say, oh, in usual cases, money is borrowed and it's financed that way. It's, it's a discrepancy. It's built in. So the question is, is D2A2 Investment Group obligated to fund the demolition project? And I think that DHCR rationally decided, and the, the court below found properly, that there's no definitive proof before the Brent administrator that D2A2 Investment Group is obligated to fund the demolition project. So because there was nothing there before the rent administrator, the decision was properly made that there was not a su sufficient finding of financial ability by the owner to complete the demolition project. Now, the operating agreement of D2A2 Investment Group was put into the record at the very end, after, the res after my client had an opportunity to respond to the PAR, sort of like a reply, at that point in time, the operating agreement of D2A2 Investment Group wasn't put into the record. I had, no, I had no idea it was there until I saw the Article 78 proceeding. You know, it's not proper to, to, put rec to put evidence into the record at such a late date and say, oh, see, this justifies what I was doing. There was no explanation why the owner could not have put in information about D2A2 Investment Group early in the process before the rent administrator so that it could have been uh, reviewed, it could have been questioned as part of the proceeding. So uh, my client asserts that the corp below made the proper decision and DHCR <coughs> made the proper decision. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you. All right. You have a minute. <laughs> so my colleague says that there's uh, <laughs> DTA2 has no obligation to fund the performance of the demolition. That's not true. D2A2, the sole member of the owner, submitted affidavits, sworn affidavits, under the penalties of perjury that says, we will commit these funds to the project. That's binding, that's dispositive. Affidavits mean something, okay? They're important, okay? And they're better than letters or anything else, so yes, there's an op the operating report talks about a capital contribution. That's a, that's a typical $100 capital contribution that's in every operating agreement. This is not a capital contribution. This is an investment. And the operating agreement specifically gives Diana Milich, as the general manager, the absolute authority to make investments. She coupled it with an affidavit stating, we will commit these funds to the project. That's consistent, in my view, with every single case on judicial precedent as to what a self-funding owner must do in order to establish their financial ability to perform the demolition. Thank you. Thank you. Elk, 33, East 33rd. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Brian Brick from Brick Law PLLC for the appellants. We are asking for the court to reverse the summary judgment decision below and also to give determination that the re-argument motion was not untimely. What I want to focus on is the new tenants that were in the premises. And the reason why I want to do that is I think that that gives the greatest ability for this court to see why the decision has to be reversed and go back down below. This is actually something that now on appeal, the landlord has conceded in the footnote that it's had a new tenant for at least the last 14 months of the lease term. Well even though that there is a liquidated damages provision. Did you not raise that issue below? We could not raise it below because it didn't arise until after. So the time frame goes like this. The briefing in the underlying motion was done by the end, the, the fall of 2021. And in that, the landlord put in a June affidavit that said- We have of, not re-rented as of today. That's right, as of now. And then there was a long period of time between when the court issued the, ju the summary judgment decision in June of 2023. But we didn't know about it. We actually, the client stumbled upon it anecdotally 
because he knows someone who is still in the building who said, hey, there's this company in the premise, this is their name, that filtered to me and we looked up the Secretary of State filing and also the NISA filings that these two tenants seem to have. Now, one of the arguments that the landlord has made is that the first company, Top Notch, is in suite 802, not the premises 905. What we think happened is that there was actually a rent agreement, at least for that first space, 905, but what this landlord does is move tenants around to different suites. And so Top Notch moved down to 802, and then the Zeiler law firm came in, uh, it looks like September of 2022. So this is a significant period of the remaining lease term. It's about 35 to 40% of the damages amount, and the record is now inconclusive because we don't know what was the rent. I mean, there is information described in the brief, but for purposes of the record, we don't know what the new rent is, how long it was actually being collected, is there a differential? Because it's only if there is an, a shortfall would the landlord then be entitled to collect the difference between that and the rent he was supposed to be getting from stickies when they were in the premises. So once the landlord chose to mitigate, this is something that has to be discounted from the liquidated damages award to keep it from being a penalty and unconscionable. And uh, so to answer Judge Kapnick's question, this isn't something that came up in the lower court record. We do submit that the landlord should have updated its motion papers because they made a representation in an affidavit that as of right now, we haven't rented this. But we didn't, don't get a decision for another 18 months or so and there should have been an update because that was where the court was deciding on the basis of an incomplete record. I don't want to cast aspersions, but we do know that that statement in the affidavit wasn't updated. But so is the, procedurally, it's a little, a little quirky. So is, is the answer then, because the, the record before us doesn't contain the information necessary to disturb the, 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 the order on appeal, is it a, a matter of having to make a 50-15 a type motion? To, to now tee this up in the proper way? I'm mean, just not sure procedurally how this ought to work in such a way that develops the right record to determine if there ought to be an offset based on mitigation, and if so, what should it be? Or so whether we should remand for that purpose. Well, that's precisely what we're asking. Um, and because the, the information is something the court can take judicial notice of, the fact, the factual dispute that- You made a tenant. motion, you made a motion to renew, re-argue, didn't did. you? How come di this didn't become part of it? We didn't know of it at that point. We still we didn't, didn't know even about know it? about the new tenant until we filed a notice of appeal and we're in the process of perfecting. The second thing I wanted to turn to is the untimely nature of the re-argument. I'm not sure why a simple look at a calendar wouldn't have shown this, but the 30th day of the period fell on a Saturday. That was July 29th. We filed the motion that next Monday, July 31st, and the lower court basically adopted in whole what the respondent's argument was that the motion was untimely. Um, and in that, the reason why it matters is because what the court overlooked was, and this has to do with the broom clean condition of the premises and the conference room table and chairs that were left behind, and there are text messages that the court did overlook that show in the beginning of the relationship, the landlord furnished the conference room furniture for the tenant. And when they vacated the premises, they left what they thought was the landlord's furniture behind. And then a whiteboard was on the wall. So that factual determination should have been um, preventing the summary judgment motion from being granted. And when you take that broom clean condition out of the way, what you then really have remaining from those surrender provisions in the guarantee are really de minimis. You have a, a few short day, a, a few days shortfall on the 120 day notice period and a signed acknowledgement form when the landlord knew they vacated because they collected keys, the agent was walking around talking with them. So it was really just more of a formality once you addressed the broom clean condition. Based on my count, I think it's off only by one day. I think it was two days, Your Honor, but yeah, it's a 120 day period. No, I know, and I, and I went through the calendar and, and because of uh, July having, I think it included July, right? Which has the 31st, so. That's exactly right. My, my counting was just one day off. But. Um, and, and because of that, and we've cited cases that say that that is something that is disregarded when you're not talking about any prejudice. They gave them notice on June 2nd and didn't vacate until the end of September. So it's not like they gave them notice and then moved out 10, 15, 20 days later. They pretty much let the entire period run 
And this also followed a long period of time where they were negotiating because it was 2020, they had financial issues and were trying to get out of the lease or get some remedy and relief and that didn't work out so they chose to surrender. Thank, Thank you, your you. honors. Good afternoon, Brian Shaw for the respondent. Um, to address counsel's first point, um, the issue of the calculation of the damages was not raised below, and it could have been raised below. There are two options here. There's a liquidated dam damages clause, or our client could have taken the rent as it became due. And the liquidated damages were reduced 4% to present day value, so it wasn't the full amount. What he could have argued is said, what we has to argue and prove below is that the liquidated damages clause is unconscionable because the, the, de the damages are grossly disproportionate to actual damages. He could have raised that argument. He did not. It also is his burden of proof. He offered nothing. So to say now, well, I didn't know that it was re-rented, he could have said, he could have argued CPL 3212F, hold it in abeyance, we need discovery as to re-renting. Didn't argue that. He could have said, this, this allows for All of that may be well and true. Are you saying that because of those things, we should ignore the fact that the landlord here is seeking to have a windfall by having both the rents and recoup from the guarantee, but that, but which the law does not allow? Does not allow windfall, Your Honor, and this is not a windfall. So not only were the damages reduced, we gave up our... our we, so you're saying that the 4% uh, discount absorbs the, uh, the, the amount of time and the rent collected between the relet and the end of the lease? Not entirely, but we also gave up... Uh, damages in the form of the broker fee, which was substantial, almost $40,000 to re-rent the premises. And the standard for unconscionability is not that you got a little bit more money. The standard is grossly disproportionate. This court has allowed three times liquidated David damages, multiple times, two times liquidated well, damages. Well, on this record, there's no way for us to know whether it is uh, substantial enough for us to do something course, about it. because you didn't raise so it. So why would... Why would, well, they can't brief something they don't know about. And in light of the fact that your side did not uh, supplement your filing, which was no longer true, why should he suffer the, the, the repercussions of that? Because, because he never disputed the damages at, at, to the trial court. So there's nothing to supplement. He never said these damages are wrong. They should be reduced if they re-rent it down the line, or this, or this clause is unconscionable. There was nothing to, there was no argument in the record as to this for us to say, oh, by the way, this happened. The whole argument below dealt with- Counsel, come on. You affirmatively say, as of today, mm -hmm. we have not re-rented. That changes and you don't supplement the record. And now he should be punished for because that? Because we weren't relying on the re-renting. The liquidated damages clause says that, that we can- That is irrelevant. You made a submission that was no longer accurate with the court. You allowed the court to make a decision based on a submission that you knew was no longer accurate. It was accurate. Because it was not accurate because it was re-rented. But that has not, but the liquidated damages clause has we nothing to do to with re-renting. We get to decide whether it has something to do with it or not. Go, going to the next point, as far as the notice, it, it, it's their burden to prove the conditions for, re for release from the guarantee. They did not state when they sent that notice. It's dated June 2nd. It's got to be served in a certain manner on, our, on, on the pursuant to lease on, on the, the landlord, as well as the landlord's attorney, either by personal delivery, overnight delivery, or by mail. They didn't say how they sent it. The only way it could have been timely is if they personally delivered it to the landlord the same day it was dated, as well as to the landlord's attorney. The record is silent as to how they delivered it, when they delivered it. In addition, so that's, that's one reason they, they didn't fulfill the, the, the conditions. The second I'm sorry, can we go back to the, the first point you sure. were addressing? Did I understand you to argue that if you elect to, to accept damages under the liquidated damages provision, then there is no offset if there's a relet? The relet would, mitigation based on relet would only apply if you elected to take the damages for the, uh, for, for the rent itself? If there was a relet before we elected to take the liquidated damages, they would certainly come into play because then we, we would know at that point what the, what the actual damages were over time. Because it was not relet, the whole point of, a, of any liquid damages, damages clause is to have a certain value for damages when you bring your claim so you don't have to wait. So the whole point of liquid damages is certainty. And at that point, it was not re-rented. Re we relied on that clause. They never disputed the application of that clause. 
So it was never an issue that we had to address before the court below. And your point is that, and if I'm wrong, by all means, correct me, that by electing the certainty of that, that liquidated damages provision, there, there could not be a, an offset based on a, a su either a, a previous or a subsequent reletting of Or previous, for sure. Okay. If, at the, if, if at the time that we made this motion and it was relet, 100% that would apply to uh, whatever sums we were seeking. And if we wanted them now, we had to discount them. And if we wanted them now, we couldn't take our broker's fee. And if we wanted them now, we couldn't take any attorney's fees or any other fees that we encouraged trying to re-rent the premises. But we wanted certainty. We gave up. We asked for a reduced amount. We didn't, we didn't get our broker's fee. We didn't get any other fees we, put, we, we expended to market the premises because we wanted certain, certainty and to have the case over and not have to wait and re, or maybe resue them down the line. How much long after the submission of that statement that it had not been relet? Was the premises? Approximately 18 months. Okay. Um, it was sub Judas for quite some time. Um, so it, again, it wasn't like it was something you know, top of the mind where I need to revisit this case or I need to check in with my client because one, it wasn't an issue raised below. And two, it was 18 months since we'd argued this case. No, you keep saying that, but it can't be raised if there's no issue at the moment. Sure, the, the, right? it, he could say, you should not enforce this clause because it has potential to, be to, look at, to have double recovery. And for that reason, it's unconscionable. It's his burden to prove this claim. And if you don't raise it below, how could you possibly be able to prove it? OK. You got two minutes on rebuttal. So the first thing I want to address is the statement that the liquidated damages provision not being proportional. The, the concept is that you, you don't just look at whether it's a factor of X to decide whether it's grossly disproportionate. When you have a penalty, it makes it unconscionable. And the penalty comes from the fact that there is an acknowledged double recovery. And so that by itself means that the liquidated damages provision is I, I mean, why did you not raise this below, even though I understand that at that time there was no new tenant, there was no relet, reletting. The possibility of reletting was certainly there. And couldn't you have said that we, we, um, we should, uh, there should not be a, re, uh, a double recovery and, and put some kind of defense in there? At that point, it would have been pure speculation because the landlord had put in an affidavit saying we didn't rent the premises to anyone else. And we had no additional information beyond that because the only way that my client found out about it is anecdotally when he bumped right. into someone who was in the building. So is it true that they, 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 they don't get, um, you don't get a sort of set off from the liquidated damages because they agreed to take a lesser amount without a lot of the other fees and that does not take into effect the fact that they may have relet it? No, we disagree with that. And actually in the lease, this is at the record 102, uh, it's 70.11.1, and that's where the lease goes into the two different options for damages. And we don't believe that the facts of the record actually allow for that election. The election is made based on the facts. The landlord doesn't get to sit there and flip a coin and say, okay, we'll go with option A or B. It's based on the facts, and the facts indicate here one of those provisions and not the other. So Why? We would be, more, be more specific. So it would be the, when it has, so I'm going to read if the landlord shall re-enter the premises, and if the tenant or if the tenant is in default for the payment of rent or additional rent hereunder, beyond the expiration of applicable notice and cure periods, or in the event of re-entry, or any summary dispossession, or other proceedings, the at the election of the landlord shall be able to get either. And then one says a sum, which at the time of such termination of this lease, or at the time of such re-entry, by value, if any, the aggregate Fixed of the fixed rental, the additional rental payment payable hereunder, which would have been payable by the tenant, uh, as the case may be, ending with the expiration date, had the landlord not so terminated, or had the landlord not so re-entered the premises, as the case may be, over the aggregate fair market value of the premises for the same period discounted to present value at 4%. So that's the first. All right, you know what? Two. I'll read it myself. I encourage your honors to look at it. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Right it's not the kind of provision that, that is uh, easy listening and understanding. That one I will take a look at. Thank you so much. All right, Vincent Diarata versus New York Post. That case first. Are your honors uh, Vincent Diarata? Yes, you may proceed. You're the only one, so you may proceed. 
Okay, uh, with respect to the court, I apologize for no jacket. Just, it's okay. I, what I do want you to do is bring that mic close to your mouth so that I can hear you, yes. okay? Okay, thank you. All right. Um, with respect to the court, a government agency entrusted with the health and welfare of the public has violated their own oath, falsified documentation, falsified inspections, and falsified remedies. The photographic evidence. No, 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 no. We're doing the New York Post case first. So the post. Okay. Oh, I didn't. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. Okay. Again. Okay. Um, All right. Can we start again? Yeah. Um, the misrepresentation of a police document, a lack of facts, is clear and actionable. For a misrepresentation or a negligent of a misrepresentation, a positive duty of assertion to convey the truth. The truth is, it was a complaint. So it's an allegation. And the 911 call three days before, two days before, and one day before were all responded to by police officers. I walked into criminal court. Um, the judge says, uh, we dismissed the case. You're released on your own reconnaissance. I'll sign it in six months, yada, 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 yada. I have walked out. I, like it never happened. I didn't even know it was in print until a year or two later. I had no idea it was online. I was an award-winning chef in the 80s. I cooked for kings, queens, dignitaries, had clearance. I was even cited and offered a job in this very court, 2003, to cook for the judges. Okay, I've worked on investigations. I've done lots of different things. But in the food service industry, I was there. Lebernadan, Oriole, um, all, all of the John George, I've worked for all of them for years, multiple times. All of a sudden, everything went dead. Silence, therapy, religion, crisis of conscience. I'm back in school because the therapist says, maybe it's your time to change. People get to know me, they're excited to know me. All of a sudden, the kids are cold. I don't understand. The teachers are aloof. I don't understand. I don't know what's, why are these people? Back in therapy, why are people aggressive? What am I doing? I'm trying everything. Basically, there was never an altercation with the police, not in any police report, and they misrepresented it. And at the title of the caption, it says, horror from the hotel from hell. Vincent Dorada hit, not allegedly hit, hit in the felt. Friends, relatives, I lost family, I am isolated. Isolated. The only friends that I came up with were Asian and asked me to teach their children how to speak English. Because today's society, I didn't know this until 2021 and someone pointed it out and it cascaded like this, it cascaded. It's a lie. That is a lie. And they're saying that the hyperlink is allowed. Okay, if something happened in public and they're allowed to do it, it's got to be accurate copy. That is not accurate copy. Okay. There was no altercation. And, there, and it is an allegation that was proven false four days before the article. It was proven false seven to nine days before the article. Okay, so based on this first case, you want us to reverse the court below? Yes. Correct? All right. Now let's go, and you have your adversary here on the next case, and that is the case versus the New York Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. You go first again. You may proceed, sir. Okay, um, a government agency that has been entrusted with the health welfare of the public violated their oath and falsified inspections and reports and left the public in endangerment. This was a retired disabled building, about 12, 1,300 people in it. Uh, then in Sandy, they converted it and brought children in. Everybody looks like bullfrogs. I had the eyes too. They're all saying allergies, the C, the, it's not, it's the infestation, 150 open violations. Um, the visual evidence in, in color, clearly 20 feet, of, you have to walk through 20 feet of feces. There's feces inside the vents of the dryers where the fans are, they're nested. Photographic evidence is there, every single one was there. There's a pile that started about this much out there. <coughs> it's this high in 2023, I tried to get the photos in. It's still there and it's growing, it's a pile. I don't wanna say any of the words of what it is. It smells, I couldn't, have, couldn't get up, I couldn't open windows. I had a, the, it, the pro, it's, it's two blocks, it's two city blocks long. It's four buildings together, hundreds and hundreds of pigeons. 
for anybody to walk onto this property and say it doesn't smell and it doesn't, it, it, they left us. I couldn't get the residents together. I couldn't stay long enough. I have medical issues too, which will probably be another case coming through here, who inspected that place for me to live. I lost my health. I couldn't breathe. I was swollen. My chest was swollen. Bleach wouldn't do it. Ammonia wouldn't do it. I went to, I went to um, the council person. I went to the borough president. I went to the board of health. I showed them vote. Nobody would do anything. In May, May 27th is the big one when they said no visible signs of infestations. And I went out on May 27th and took those visible signs of infestation and supplied it to you. They lied. They kept us in infestation and lied. And it clearly states here that you could go beyond the scope of anything if the public is in danger. Not only the public is in danger, I'm part of the public too. What happened to me? I, I had surgery. I was in bed. I couldn't move. I had complications from the surgeries. And, and another department that moved me into that building knew that I, they, they saw it. They knew. I don't understand what happened. Okay, why don't we give the other side a chance to respond and you'll have a minute on rebuttal. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court, Philip Young here on behalf of the Department of Health. This court should affirm because Supreme Court correctly construed this as an Article 78 petition and then dismissed it as untimely since it was filed more than 19 months after the department closed out the last 311 complaint at issue here. Council and, and, and based on the record and the timing, uh, you may indeed be correct that um, it is untimely, but the subject matter of this case is quite disturbing. People should not have to live in squalor. <coughs> they should not have to live in an apartment where they can't open their windows because the stench of bird feces is so overwhelming that they get sick. I mean, this is just basics, right? So I say this because you and I both know what the legal standard is. But it seems to me that the city has a moral obligation to do what is right. And I hope they do that, okay? Thank you, Your Honor, I understand. No further questions, no further. We'll ask the court to affirm, thank you. Thank you. Uh, as for the time bar, this was during COVID. Everybody gave uh, extra time during court, months, three months, whatever. I was ill, I couldn't make it. I could not get one pro bono lawyer to come out. They were all closed. The only thing they were doing was evictions. No one would hear me. It took me eight months to start walking again after this. Eight months. That's September. And it wasn't 19 months. I put the, uh, I don't know where that number comes from. I'm sure everybody's using different numbers. But it, um, from May 27th, I moved out that April. I filed that December. Okay, so however this 19, it wasn't 19 months, it was less than We years. have a four month statute of limitations on these cases is right. the problem. But sir, I wanna thank you for bringing your case to court. We hope that you uh, feel better and get better and we wanna thank you, okay? Thank you. At last, Sportswear versus Byron. may proceed. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the court, Fabian Thayambali of Shapiro Arado Bach for Plaintiff Appellant Respondent at Last Sportswear. None of the tort claims that at Last Sportswear pled should have been dismissed as duplicative of its claim for breach of contract. The dismissed tort claim should be reinstated, and there are two straightforward paths to reach that result. First, as this court reaffirmed just two months ago in a case called Chazen versus Ma, where parallel claims are based on independent sources of duty, they are not duplicative. The citation for that is 223 83rd 608 at page 610. 
We cited this case in our reply brief after it was decided. We cited a number of other cases from this court, including the 2023 Calderoni decision, the 2017 decision in 37 East 50th Street Corporation. Uh, Defendant Byron had the last word in this case. She had two briefs. She didn't address any of this binding precedent. It's dispositive here because Byron undisputedly had a common law duty of loyalty to her employer at last. She violated that duty by stealing confidential information and proprietary materials. So like any other employer in that situation, at last was permitted to plead tort claims in addition to contract claims. Right, because at least with regard to that particular claim, the damages are different from the breach of contract claim. For the uh, fiduciary duty claim, there's an additional remedy uh, under the faithless servant doctrine that permits at last to recover compensation that was previously given to Ms. Byron. Didn't the court leave the breach of fiduciary duty claim in the case? Uh, Yes, Your Honor. The court, because of the unique remedy for the fiduciary claim. That's already still there. It's the other claims that you're concerned about. Precisely, and I, think, I believe Byron's uh, cross appeal was attempting to get that claim dismissed, and it shouldn't right, be. Right, exactly. For the but reasons we've just described, but uh, the argument I made concerning an independent legal duty applies to the claims that were dismissed, the unfair competition claim and the misappropriation claim. And in addition, because Byron challenges the validity of the contract, she asserts defenses that would apply just to the contract and not the tort claims, we should also be allowed to plead tort claims in the alternative, the alternative. Uh, in case the contract claim is defeated. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Certain underwriters versus Martin. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Your Honors. May it please the court. Alexandra Sperber on behalf of Appellant Denny Martin. An insurer seeking to rescind the policy must show two things. There was a misrepresentation in the policy application and that the misrepresentation was material. Here, Lloyd's established neither of those elements. How can you say that these misrepresentations were not material? Well, in order to show that a misrepresentation is material, the insurer is required to submit, number one, some version of their underwriting guidelines, and number two, a affidavit from their underwriter that goes beyond something that is. I don't. I don't need to see guidelines on this fact pattern to understand that this is a policy that would have never been entered had all of the facts been disclosed. Well, Your Honor, I, I believe the court does need to see guidelines. So the, the only cases that Lloyd's has cited in support of the idea that. Uh, an insurer might be able to uh, seek rescission without guidelines are cases where the uh, misrepresentation went to the risk being insured. Uh, yeah. And in this case, that's, that's not the case. This is a disability policy. Your, your client's practice was primarily Medicaid and Medicare based, right? That's correct, Your Honor. And at the time that uh, he submitted these applications, he was under investigation for Medicaid fraud. That's not correct, Your Honor. That's not correct. No, Your Honor. The, the investigation began years later. Um, so at the time, the, 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 the only evidence of any kind of misrepresentation submitted by Lloyds is plea elocution. A what? Plea elocution from Dr. Martin. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that's the only problem you have, but go ahead. Well, <laughs> that is not the only problem you have, but you go ahead. So, so the, Martin signed the application on April 12th, 2018. Right. The question is, as of that date, when he signed the application, did he have any knowledge that would have required him to answer yes to the question, are you aware of any fact that could change your occupation or financial stability? The only evidence they've submitted in relation to that question is his plea allocation. Plea allocution in which they, they assert that Martin uh, admitted that at, at the time he was engaged in healthcare fraud, not that he was being investigated for healthcare fraud. But if you actually if read the- If a physician uh, is engaged in healthcare fraud, whether or not he or she knows that they're under investigation therefore, 
wouldn't they know or should know that their, their, uh, their income is on shaky footing because the fraud at any point could be discontinued or could be investigated? So, so well, there is no evidence that he actually was engaged in health care fraud on April 12, 2018. Right, the, the he admitted it. I mean, he admitted it later <laughs> during his allocution. He said that it started some... As 2015. As 2015. No, no, Your Honor, he, he did not. Yes, yeah. he did. The, the allocution that's being referenced is there are two separate paragraphs. The first paragraph, he used a time frame during which he owned his, his medical practice. The second pra paragraph says, I became aware of complaints from patients about uh, improper billing. Uh, and then that, further down, it says, I consciously avoided confirming whether those, those, those complaints were, were true. So the only dates given are when he actually owned the practice. And I'll, I'll point the court to the right. He doesn't get to, you see, when you plead guilty after a, a recitation of the facts have been read, and you say, yes, 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 Your Honor, you have accepted all of those facts. And in the court's recitation, the court says, from 2015 to 2019, you engaged in Medicare fraud. And he says, yes, 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 Your Honor. Y Your Honor, I, I, I... I'm reading it right here. Okay. It, I'm looking at the elocution. There, there, is, there is case law in New York that... A guilty plea is collateral estoppel only as to facts admitted during the plea elocution. We cite that in our brief. And in his elocution, there is nowhere where he actually says, number he one. He doesn't have to actually say the words. If the facts are recited and he agrees with them, that's enough. Well, the, the, the indictment against him did not lay out specific dates. The indictment doesn't have to. The indictment is very, very summary. You're talking to a former criminal practitioner, so. Your, Your Honor, I, I, I understand. Sorry, no but cigar. The court also did not lay out at the time dates Doesn't when have this actually to. occurred. All the court has to do is lay out the necessary elements of the crime and get the defendant to say yes. And your client said yes three times. And, and we're not disputing that he pled guilty. Okay. We're only disputing that his guilty plea establishes the dates on which the, which the actual crime was occurring. All right, you'll have time on rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honor. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Judy Shalmetsi from Wilson Elser for Lloyds. Um, Your Honor, I, I will happily take any questions from the court. I do believe that it is. Is the allocution here. lacking in the necessary facts to show for the relevant time period that uh, the uh, plaintiff here, in, uh, the, no, the defendant here engaged in fraudulent Medicare uh, billing? It is not, Your Honor. On page uh, 611 of the record, the court says, so I understand that you are seeking to plead today to the charge of health care fraud. That is count one of the indictment, and it charges that in or about in between, sorry, June 15, 2015, and September 2019. In the Eastern District of New York, you, together with others, did knowingly and willfully execute and attempt to execute a scheme to defraud. Um, the knowing part of it goes to the question of would, would you have known if you're doing this that you're going to go to jail and other bad things will happen, but just the top of the list is you're going to go to jail, um, or you're at least you're at risk of that. And of course, the dates are right in there, and, and Your Honor is quite correct that exchange ends with yes, 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 Your Honor. Unless Anything there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you. You have one minute. I'll just refer the court in our brief, we refer, uh, uh, our reply brief, page 16. Uh, we cite two cases, SEC versus Thompson and Hughes versus Barry. Uh, the second, first one is from the Southern District. The second one is from the First, Depart first Department uh, for the proposition that uh, where, where there is a plea elocution, the court must examine the plea elocution itself in determining whether collateral estoppel applies, I'll direct the court to the, not direct the court, I'll, I'll refer the court to the, to the allocution, which I believe is very clear. You can direct us to it, that's okay. <laughs> I, I apologize for that, Your Honor. That's quite all right, it's, that language is fine. Uh, which I, I believe is clear that there's, there's, no, there's no date set for when 
Mr. Martin is, is admitting to the crime actually occurring or being aware of the crime is occurring. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Dragons 50, uh, 516 Limited versus Knights Genesis and Shanghai Municipal Investments. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the court, Adam Pollock from Pollock Cohen LLP. For we represent two defendants, two appellants here, who are two Chinese companies. The first is Shanghai Municipal Investment Group Corporation, and the second one is Shanghai SMI Assets Management Group. These are two foreign companies in China with no connection whatsoever to New York other than the fact that they formerly indirectly owned a US subsidiary that did business with plaintiff. Plaintiff in this case does not allege any actions, not a single action that our clients were involved in by these two foreign companies. So uh, obviously there's an alter ego, the whole question of the alter ego, and the judge below found that there was enough to keep them in. Why do you say that there was not? They seem to have listed a lot of things. Were they not substantial enough? Did they not really uh, af affect what the, the things that we're looking for when we're trying to determine whether or not there's a, a sufficient alter ego pleading? Justice Kapnick, that's exactly the, what our appeal stems from, which is there are 10 factors that this court typically looks to. And those 10 factors are basically getting at what my kids would say, are these the same company or not, right? And in those 10 factors, only one was met here, which is there was a little bit of overlap between officers and directors. The other nine factors, courts are looking at intermingling of funds. Courts are looking at shared office space. Courts are looking at parent really controlling the subsidiary. None of those were here. Instead, the court looked at the business court cards were similar. The business cards are similar is a normal feature of a parent-subsidiary relationship. The court looked at the websites mentioned each other. Again, a normal feature. These are not factors. In fact, this court has held, we don't look at those generic marketing indicia because those aren't factors that we're trying to get at, which is, come on, are these two companies really the same thing? How and would, a, how would a, a party on a pre-answer, pre-discovery motion, how would a plaintiff be in a position to normally plead those type of elements? Um, given that you know, the, the intricacies of the, the corporate relations might be you know, in the exclusive province of the defendants. So Justice Higgett, the defendant, excuse me, the plaintiff here had a previous case, in fact it was before this court once before, and they did discovery, this plaintiff did discovery in that case, and they came up with what they came up with, and they have not been able to point to any additional facts. Normally when this court is, when plaintiffs are asking for jurisdictional discovery, the plaintiff is saying, this is the fact that we would need. This is the fact that's in dispute. Or they're making an allegation and defendant is saying, that's not true. Here, there's no dispute about the facts. There's no one thing that plaintiff would like in jurisdictional discovery that's separable than full merits discovery. And the problem here is, if this court were to allow plaintiffs to come into New York and allege that foreign parents were alter egos on such a thin set of allegations, this court would be flooded with these kind of disputes in cases like this where there really is a formal parent subsidiary relationship. Is there any financial dependency between SMI USA and SMI? To the contrary, there's no, alle there's no <coughs> allegation in this case that there's any financial dependency in fact, plaintiff's own complaint alleges separate financial statements, alleges separate, separate finances, alleges separate meetings. These are allegations. Is there any allegation that uh, the parent companies benefited in any way from the transaction between SMI USA and uh, the defendants here? Your Honor, there's no the such allegation. I mean. I imagine that in any parent subsidiary, any normal relationship, of course, perhaps there is some benefit. I am not aware of anyone here, any such benefit here, and there's no such allegation in the, in the complaint. complaint. Okay. 
All right. In I have you have about 25 seconds right, left, so you decide how I'll, to use them. <laughs> yeah, I'll go quickly, and I'll save a bit of time for rebuttal. The other issue here is that the lower court failed to distinguish between the two different entities that we represent. There's two different entities, and sort of started its analysis by assuming that they're already alter egos, and then improperly aggregated them. The court should have wasn't made wasn't the only one to make that mistake, right? <laughs> Your Honor, from an efficiency standpoint, we have a foreign client, two foreign clients, that gets hauled into New York courts. Not surprising that they're going to save resources, like many defendants in a, other cases, by hiring one counsel. But that's not the mistake, merely an efficiency standpoint. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Uh, Karen King from Orvillo Abramovitz for the plaintiff respondent in this case. Uh, let me just start with the prior case uh, that uh, Mr. Pollack uh, discussed. That was a contract case because originally this seemed to be a breach of contract. It was only after that case started uh, moving forward that it was discovered that this was in fact a very complex real estate fraud. That contract case did not involve SMI uh, in the Shanghai entities because it was against the contractual party. But now that it's un uh, uncovered that this is in fact a very complex fraud, uh, there are indicia that uh, this is much bigger than just the uh, immediate contract case and the discovery in that case would have nothing to do with the alter ego status because it was so narrow. Now that we're dealing with a complex fraud and there's no dispute that SMI USA was in the middle of the story. Wait, wait a minute because <laughs> yes. you kind of glossed over that really quickly. Uh, the, the discovery on a contract case seems to me would be precisely the kind of discovery that one would begin on this case. So I don't understand how the discovery on that case, if it involved all of the same parties, would not be fruitful in understanding certainly the corporate structure and the interrelationships between these two parent companies and this sub. The, in the contract case, um, certainly communications and, and some of the documents produced there would be relevant to this, but it didn't go to approvals and the corporate chain of command and who was talking to who and appointing uh, leadership of SMI USA in that case. Can we go back to his uh, uh, first uh, argument, counsel's first argument, sure. that the only factor alleged was the overlap in uh, ownership, nothing else. Can you? That, that is absolutely not correct. Uh, as you can see from the lower court's opinion, there was a detailed discussion of the many allegations in the complaint. Uh, you can find them at record 14 to 16 uh, of the complaint itself. And of course, the uh, lower court. Tell, tell me what aspects of the complaint yeah. go specifically to the connection of the parent company with SMI USA that we can even infer sure. uh, that there is this alter ego uh, dynamic yes, going on. Of course. Um, well, first of all, uh, we disagree with Mr. Pollock's characterization that there was an indirect ownership. This was a wholly owned subsidiary, uh, both uh, SMI USA and SMI Assets, all owned by the same parent company. But that alone isn't enough, right? That alone is not enough. Okay. We agree that no one factor is the determining factor here, but you have to look at the whole picture. We would also say that you don't have to meet every single factor. But here you have a company that directs the leadership of SMI USA. You have great overlap in the directors and the executive management. Uh, I, I, how, because I, in the papers, I only saw one or two. So, so what is this great overlap? Well, there, there, Other I think there were at least three or right? four names um, that were mentioned. There was a director and a chairman that's uh, the same for SMI. Tao. No, Tao is the head of SMI USA, and yes, he was appointed. He's the one that has no real estate credentials at all and seems to be a figurehead. Um, there is the mutual reference to each other, SMI USA saying they have a Shanghai office. SMI Shanghai putting this particular real estate project and others in New York from SMI USA's portfolio on its own, claiming it as its own. Uh, and we have um, just the uh, suspicious spinoff of SMI USA as soon as the lawsuits start coming, uh, which 
to us indicates that there's something going on with the financial dependence and the protection of assets to try to avoid judgment. Um, and uh, we have representations during the negotiations about SMI USA being backed by SMI, which ultimately is backed by the Shanghai municipal government. And so those representations, the business cards, which again, not alone, that doesn't establish alter ego by itself, but we're looking at the whole picture. Any the allegations whole, that the parent companies exercised any control of the everyday operations, any allegations? That, that goes to the appointment of the leadership of SMI USA, as well as the overlap in the board and the chairman and a certain senior leaders. That's well, where they the appoint comes one in. person, and that one person also sits on another board, and that's enough? No, they, they do appoint Tom Tao, which, and he is, I think, from, from right. the head. But there is also a chairman uh, whose name escapes me and, and another figure that overlaps. Between. The chairman of the board? Uh, the chairman, I believe, of the board, yes. The chairman of the board is not responsible for the day-to-day -day operations of a company. No. no, that would be Tom Tao or the CIO, Kevin Gao. And those individuals, we allege, were appointed. It's a very small, we don't think a real entity. It's just a platform to engage in the U.S. real estate transactions what about on the behalf of the company. Because a lot of what you're saying sounds sort of similar. What about the intermingling of funds and anything like that? That's very common. We don't have the financial records of the parent company um, or, or the lower company at this point. They refused to give it to us because it wasn't relevant to the contract claims. So you see there's sort of this gamesmanship going on throughout this case to try to understand who is who and who is really I don't know that it's wrong. gamesmanship. You're not entitled to the financial records of a parent company just because they happen to have a sub, right? They, you, you certainly have to do a lot more than that to access a company's... Well, the financial thing we records. asked for is records of where the money went. There's no dispute that there was a fraud here of $30 million and that there was an account that was opened up by SMI USA and that money did go back to SMI USA. We don't have the records of what happened from there and there's been sort of a stalling process. I mean, this has been pending for years now of not providing any information. And the Supreme Court, I think, correctly recognized that there's something going on here. It's worthy of at least jurisdictional discovery. We're only still at the pleading stage. And we need information in order to understand these relationships. And at the summary judgment stage, they can come back up here and demonstrate how they have nothing to do with this. But there's enough <laughs> suspicious allegations and indicia that there is an alter ego uh, relationship to warrant this case moving forward and giving us more information. Thank you. You have two minutes on, re on rebuttal. Thank you, Your Honors. Uh, really briefly, uh, a couple points. One is, uh, Ms. King is correct, the complaint does allege that it was fully owned, that the subsidiary was fully owned, that happens to be incorrect, which is what we were getting to earlier. That's the pleading allegation. That's what's in the record before your honors. They had the opportunity to do discovery in the prior case. They had the opportunity to ask all these questions when they deposed the guy, the local guy from SMI USA. They got documents. They had plenty of opportunity. This case has not been going on for years. That's the prior case. On the factors, I think the name that your honor was looking for was <coughs> Um, Huyang Liu, Q-U-I-A-N-G-L-I-U, mm -hmm. who is the chairman, who is not exercising day-to-day -day control. And I think the important point here is that there's a real difference between appointment of officers and interference. Interference with officers shuffling officers back and forth, exercising day-to-day -day control. There's no allegation of any of that here. And to your honor's point, there's no Although you, you, you must admit that the appointment of someone with zero real estate background to head a uh, U.S.-based uh, sub of a company like Shanghai Municipal Investment is kind of suspect. So, Your Honor, this court doesn't get into the business of evaluating if somebody has a thin resume or a thick resume. And frankly, or a non-existent. Or a non-existent <laughs> resume. And frankly, if you walk around real estate companies in midtown Manhattan, you might find a bunch more thin resumes. This court shouldn't, I would respectfully submit, be in the basis 
of evaluating resumes. This court has laid out 10 factors that they're trying to figure out, are these basically the same com companies? And I keep looking at the Schnell case from Staten Island where you've got a bunch of guys at the mall sitting around at the, out at the Empire State Mall right in Staten Island. They're basically, they've got a bunch of different entities and they're all in the same office space and they're all commingling funds. That is when courts in New York say, those are alter egos for pleading purposes. Trying to sort out, is this resume good enough, isn't uh, work that the court has identified in those 10 factors. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last but not least, Florella versus Trustees of Columbia. Justice Kennedy is recused on this case, and should there be a tie, uh, in accordance with the Appellate Division First Department rules, another justice will be vouched in. Good evening, gentlemen. Okay. You may proceed. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. My name is Gennaro Savastano. I'm here on behalf of LF Tarakis, LF Tarakis and Panek, representing plaintiff appellant John Charula. Um, my hope is that I'm the briefest of arguments you hear today, given the first argument on the calendar. Um, this court, as you know, hears 20,000 labor law cases a year, so I'm confident that you're- <laughs> We got the two on this issue today. That's right, like Your that. Honor. <laughs> so we respectfully ask that the court reverse the subject order insofar as it denied plaintiff's cross motion for summary judgment on the issue of labor law 240. Um, there's absolutely no question of fact on the issue of foreseeability here, where there was a blow up patch of an interstitial ceiling that was semi-demolished riddled with 80 to 90 holes, patched, covered holes, open holes, and had been undergoing demolition for months. Uh, not only was this foreseeable, it was actually foreseen. Um, Mr. Menard, who was Columbia's project manager, repeatedly testified that he told Mr. Clausen, ACC supervisor, to provide, and this is a quote, protection over the openings or some type of fencing to prevent people from stepping into the openings. So it's really rich that they're arguing that there's no elevation related risk or that it's unforeseeable. This should be an Wasn't easy- Wasn't he tasked at the moment to erect netting protection so that other workers on that floor would not fall through the holes? That is absolutely correct and accurate, Your Honor. There can be no dispute in that. It's not a disputed fact in the record. He was sent up there to install fall protection. Those are the words of defendant's own witnesses. Is there any evidence in the record that when he was sent up there to install fall protections, that he was provided with any fall protections for him? Absolutely not, and that's why we're here. There was no safety device to even allege. There was no brace, there was no lanyard, there was no harness, there was nothing. I certainly don't begrudge my very able adversaries for arguing foreseeability because what else were they gonna argue? They provided him nothing, they sent him to a demolition site with, to step on patched up sheet rock. I mean, this was Swiss cheese. There were 80 to 90 holes. They've been taking out diffusers for months. Um, I think the court, fully understands the issues. Unless you have any questions, I will yield my time. Okay. Next. May it please the court, Scott Brody from the Brody Law Group for the Trustees of Columbia. Uh, Justice Manzanette, uh, my friend Brian Isaac addressed Jones with you earlier, and I sense your concern with regards to the fact that this gentleman was in a position of putting in netting, perimeter netting, not netting under the place where he was working at the time of this incident. The plaintiff- But the purpose of the netting was so that other workers would not fall through the hole. Not underneath where he was working. He was tasked with putting in- The point is, what, what is relevant, what is relevant there is, is- Sir, I'm talking. I apologize, Your Honor. Uh, what is relevant is whether he was exposed to an elevation-related risk. I, I and, and that's agree. what Jones stands for. Okay. I agree, Your Honor. Okay. Two points. Perimeter netting is at the exteriors, not underneath. 
They were not addressing putting netting in underneath so that anybody who fell through where he was working would be caught by a net. I just want that to be clear. And I'm going to use the Swiss cheese argument in a second. But I want to point out what the court below said, because it is pivotal to this case and undermines the plaintiff's argument. The court below said that we acknowledge that there were places in this floor that were opened and they required patching. And under the labor law, where those areas are patched, if they are insufficiently patched and the plaintiff had fallen through them, that would create liability on the owners, including my client. However, the court below said, but wait a second, the place where he fell wasn't one of those locations. So the fact that there's openings all around the floor is not a proximate cause of his accident, or it may not be, because plaintiff failed to prove that he fell through one of those openings. And I want to go- what, what, what required that he prove that he fell through one of those openings? Because the plaintiff specifically, by the way, plaintiff is the shop, for, shop steward. He's thoroughly familiar with the area, and he himself stated that the interstitial space flooring itself was safe to walk on. Yeah, perhaps prior to all of the demolition on the floor. Except that he testified. He's the plaintiff. He's the shop steward. He testified that at the place where his accident happened, the floor was safe for walking on. And in fact, he did not step through one of those unprotected Swiss cheese holes. He himself testified that when he was walking, his leg went through the sheetrock, the permanent part of the interstitial floor which failed. Not an opening, not something that was, was repaired. Using the Swiss cheese argument for a moment. If so, you have so a you're piece, asking us to kind of say if he fell here, that would be labor law 240. But if he fell over here, it wouldn't. But if he fell here, it might. I mean, it's it's one area. It's very, I mean, he's up there. He's asked to put up even if perimeter um, netting to you know protect the workers. And it's, it's a mess up there just because he didn't fall exactly where there was some Swiss cheese. I don't know Justice if we Kavnick, can distinguish Let's that. use a simple analogy. Person's working on the roof of a building. There's a skylight. They take out the opening of the skylight and they use that to pass debris through to the floor below. That's, let's use that example. If that's covered up or not covered up and the person falls through that opening, that this court has held is liability under labor law 240. But if that person is repairing the skylight and he opens it, but he falls while he's walking on the rest of the roof, and the rest of the roof is part of the permanent structure, this court in Jones has said it must be foreseeable that he would nope. fall I mean, through the roof. Sorry, that's not what Jones says. And I, I disagree with you wholeheartedly on your characterization of what that case holds. Well, so I, I will stand on the law, and it, should this court distinguish it or change it in its decision, then we have to address that. But sir, what under Jones has to be foreseeable? The, that the place where he fell, the surface that he fell on, was part of a temporary structure rather than the permanent structure. Here, the openings that were created in removing the air conditioning ducts, those openings were temporary. And they had to be covered, and if he fell through one of those temporary coverings, then liability would have been created. But if, if we had an opening here in this floor because we were doing a repair of the pipes below it and we opened right here and the plaintiff fell way over there having nothing to do with this opening, but he fell through the floor, liability would not attach. Because okay? it wouldn't be foreseeable that he would fall, he or she would fall there. Over there. It, basically, what this court is saying is if we make an opening in a floor in a building, if the person goes through that floor, anywhere else on that floor, liability attaches. And I understand that the court wants to say, but the testimony is there were a lot of openings in the floor. 
Yes, I agree. That's the testimony. But the plaintiff himself and Mr. Menard both testified that those openings were being covered. The plaintiff didn't fall through one of those openings or the places that were being covered. He fell someplace else that he was able to observe that he thought was safe. He's the shop steward. His job to let people know if something is unsafe, he never did because he didn't think it was, but he did fall through it. And the Thank question becomes... Thank you. Thank you. You asked for three Good afternoon. Minutes. May it please the court. Ira Goldstein with Morris Duffy, Alonzo Faley, and Pitkoff for the third party defendant respondent ACC Construction Corporation. Uh, one of the main uh, parts of the lower court decision was that plaintiff didn't have an expert. I mean, let's put everything in perspective. One is not required. Well, we have a 12,000 square foot space. and. If you look at a football field, that's 300 feet long. I just say it was 40 feet wide. I mean, that is a very, very large area. So when he says Swiss cheese holes, there's no expert to say there's holes every, every inch. Or they could have been scattered around. They didn't have an expert examine this. A structural engineer did not put forth an opinion on that issue, saying that, yeah, it, this was foreseeable based on this. But again, those holes scattered around had nothing to do with this accident. It was a patched hole, and in Jones, um, we had a similar case. It was a permanent floor. Plaintiff went through. Plaintiff put forth his personal opinion that it was uh, rotted, which plaintiff here did said it was spotty. Similar situation. We need an expert to make that determination. Otherwise, you know, you're taking plaintiff's counsel, plaintiff's own personal opinions. Well, your, your adversary wants us to take the plaintiff's word when he keeps saying he's shop steward, so anything he says should be golden, right? Well, so... Well, yeah, well, plaintiff did say he saw nothing noticeably wrong with the area. So, I mean, that is a factual uh, portion of the testimony that we can accept, but we can't accept a uh, structural engineering analysis on that issue, which is, I think, the primary point. Uh, so, so we should not accept, as your adversary was suggesting, that um, since the plaintiff said uh, it was perfectly safe to walk on, since he's not an expert, I should put no credence in that argument based on what you've just said. Well, I, I, we could just go with what plaintiff. We, we can't, you can't have it both ways, right? No. You can't, you can't pick and choose which parts of the testimony you like and which parts you don't like and which ones we can credit and which ones we can't. Well, the heart of this case goes to that patch that seemed sufficient and. And wasn't. Plaintiff went through it, but there was no expert to look at that take that piece of uh, gypsum board, whoever that was, and look at it and say, yeah, this was not sufficient to hold his weight. I mean, it, it comes down to the fact that there was no expert. Well, we don't need an expert to, to, to say that because his foot went through the board. So we know it wasn't sufficient to hold his weight. His foot went right through. So the issue is whether one could have discerned that, right? Well, I correct. guess. But it was intended to be a permanent structure as opposed to a temporary scaffolding with a I, 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 you know, I, and I get that. The problem is that once you start making holes in this permanent structure, I'm not an engineer, but it would seem to me if you start creating holes throughout a floor, the integrity of that floor might start becoming compromised. And that's where the issue lies with, right? and you need an expert because you and I can't make that determination. No, but uh, you know, a foot going through a, a, a floor shouldn't happen either it, unless it was compromised, so. Thank you. But I got your point. Thank you. And you have two minutes. I'll be very brief, your honors. <clears throat> Mr. Clausen, my adversary's representative, himself testified that um, you compromise the integrity of the boards with patches because when the drywall is cut, obviously the patch is less uh, secure structurally than a, 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 a slab in its entirety. Secondly, I just want to address Justice Kapnitz's point about um, the manner in which they're trying to frame the issue so narrowly so as to have... Um, ignore the, the ceiling in its entirety and somehow say that we have to step on that particular patch 
and that particular patch has to, be, has to be foreseeable. It's really against this court's precedent in terms of how they define foreseeability. So, sir, what had to be foreseeable? Was it that uh, this particular area where the plaintiff was working on that he testified himself was, was otherwise stable? Does it, does it, did it have to be foreseeable that that particular space that he was working on at the moment of the accident presented an elevation-related hazard? Was it that this, this expansive uh, floor area in general presented a, a, a foreseeable elevation-related hazard? What exactly is our foreseeability inquiry here? So the, the test under this court's precedent, precedent in Vasquez and in uh, Mena come, says plaintiff's injuries were foreseeable in light of the task. So he was ascending eight, eight feet to install fall protection. I don't know how much more foreseeable we could get. Both of those cases find genesis from the Gordon Court of Appeals case. So it's a progeny of that natural out outgrowth. Gordon specifically says, um, plaintiff need not demonstrate the precise manner in which the accident happened or the injuries occurred was foreseeable. It is sufficient that he demonstrate that the risk of some injury was reasonable. And unless the court has any other questions, I'll yield my time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.